everyone, and welcome back to the Covey Wellness Center podcast in our season three, where we are talking to authors, mostly local to our area and people who are writing about things that we really feel are intersecting with the wellness space that we work in as counselors and holistic um, support here at Covey Wellness Center. And so today, our guest, Arthur Bors, is no exception to that. He has been writing for some time, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but we're going to focus primarily on his newest uh, book, which is a memoir where he talks about growing up in um, childhood trauma and his healing journey through that. And I'm really excited to get into this conversation um, for a few reasons, but not the least of which is that, um, as I say, sometimes people have their meet cute stories. And so these are these fun ways in which people find each other in the world um, and come to know one another. And so I wanted to share by way of introduction to this, a little bit of our meet cute story. So, um, oh, so uh, Arthur and I have uh, shared friends uh, who are neighbors to him when he is up North in Bracebridge on the Muskoka river. And as you'll soon find out about Arthur when he shares a bit about himself, um, he describes himself as a pilgrim, a paddler, and an author. And so I first met him as a paddler, although I have learned about his pilgrim and author parts before from my our mutual friends who had met him and had told me about him and said, oh gosh, Sarah, I think you and Arthur would really be kindred spirits. And then I think the same, if I'm not mistaken, Arthur, they said to you, you probably really want to meet Sarah, you know, you guys are two peas in a pod. And so, so we had this, we had heard about each other, you know, the mystery of each other. And then we had this very interesting interaction where I happened to be staying at these friends of ours, um, their place. Um, as a gift that they gave to me just to be able to come for a few retreat days, um, which was glorious and wonderful. And it's in seeped in nature, which is so important to me for those kinds of times. And I was sitting on the dock and along comes a paddler (laughs) and I'm looking at the paddler and he's looking at me thinking, you're not the people who are supposed to live here. I know the people who live here. And I'm looking at him thinking, I wonder if this is the person that the people who live here told me about. And so anyway, there was this sort of, are you Sarah? Are you Arthur moment? Oh, okay. And so then we had this lovely, spontaneous conversation on the dock and in the kayak, on you know, in the, in the Muskoka river at -hmm. our mutual friends place, totally Mm -hmm. independent of them, which was really, really fun. Yeah. And, and it was a pretty long conversation as I recall. We, yes. And we realized exactly what it was that our friends had been telling us about, which is that we probably need to meet and have more conversations. And so right. here we are having one of those conversations on the podcast. And so I've been looking forward to more conversations with Arthur ever since that, that meet cute point on the dock on the Muskoka river. Um, and I think that tells you a lot about the two of us, but also, um, you know, just so interesting how we come together as people and find one another in this crazy world. And so um, I'm really looking forward to what this conversation will bring forward about our shared heart for for healing, um, for people being able to tell stories of um, pain and being honest about the pain, but also about the redemption and the possibility and the hope in that. And so I I know that those we are shared lovers of nature, but we are also um, uh, shared and passionate in our hearts for healing and for the good that can come even through um, deep suffering. Uh, so I'm I'm so excited for this. So I'm going to throw it to you, Arthur, just to add a few more details about your, uh, you know, bio details, essentially, who you are, where do you find yourself in the world? Let's just help listeners get to know you a little bit better before we jump into the questions. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me here. And it was a lot of fun, the conversation we had by the dock there. And one of the reasons I was looking at the dock is because Bruce, our one friend, he's he often sits out there. And so I've had many long conversations with him uh, where I'm sitting in the kayak and he's sitting on the dock doing his morning devotions. And And taking pictures of birds. 
taking lots of pictures. You have a few pictures of me too, I believe. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, and then I, I saw you and I thought, hmm, I, I wonder if that's Sarah that I've heard about. So, yes. so it'll be wonderful to meet you. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so I'm a, an Anglican priest in Toronto. I'm serving as, as an interim right now. And I've lived in Toronto 15, 15 years. I've lived in many different places. I was born here in southern Ontario, the, the child of immigrants. And uh, pretty much all my adult life, I've been a pastor. For two stretches, I was a seminary professor. And uh, I'm pastoring again. I, I like pastoring better than I like teaching, I, mm. I discovered. So my wife and I, we celebrated our 44th wedding anniversary last week. Oh, congratulations. I'm 24, so you're 20 years ahead of me. All right, yeah. <laughs> um, I was really smart to marry in uh, 1980, a year with a zero on it. So I married in 2000. I'm even smarter exactly. than you. <laughs> so, but I just mean it easy to calculate. To calculate, yeah, for sure. How many years, right? Super so, easy. Uh, yeah, and we're yeah. the parents of two adult children. They're both married, and we have we have one grandchild. And an uh, important part of my identity is that I'm a writer. You've mentioned that already. I've been writing, I guess, for 40 years or more, and uh, but I've been publishing books for a little over 30 years by now. Wow. Yeah, and there's so much. I mean, it's hard when authors come on because if they do have more than one book, which of course you do, and certainly other writings as well, I'm fascinated by all of it. And so we're going to stay in the lane of your most recent yes. book, but I would definitely Absolutely. encourage people to look at the rest of what um, Arthur has written um, in particular. I think it's Living Into Focus, if I've got the... Yeah, yes, that's the book that was gifted to me. And so that was the one I was first introduced to. And and so much to say there in our age of distraction uh -huh. um, about, you know, the attentive life. And uh, so that's that's a wonderful resource as well that I'm familiar with. But I, I hope that I always hope that these conversations will introduce people to these authors, of course, encourage them to right. want to dig deeper. And if they're resonating to find other mentors and leaders. I don't know about you, Arthur, but I know for me, so many of my mentors and spiritual leaders have come in the form of authors that have gone yes. before, you know? And so on those pilgrimages that we find ourselves on, we need those guides. And um, I just love that you're one of those people, you know, speaking into those stories. So that's wonderful. So let's start off just with sort of the origin story. You know, everybody has, um, I mean, obviously this is a memoir, so it's, 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 it's its own origin story, not just in the book itself being birthed, but it's actually your origin story in some ways as a person. But okay. tell me a little bit about what brought you to write Shattered, to write this memoir. What well, led you at this point in time to address this topic? Right. Right. So it's always hard to know where to start with origin stories, of course. Yes. But uh, about 20 years ago, I started noticing that there, that there were authors that I really appreciated, not only for their ideas that resonated with me or challenged me, but also for the quality of their writing. And yes. uh, so I started paying more and more attention to authors who were good writers. Yes. And, uh, and I longed to become a better writer. I decided to become a better writer. Mm. And, uh, I'd written a number of books in what we, we would call pastoral theology, or practical theology, sure. on conflict resolution or dealing with technology or the Lord's Prayer, you know, a, a number of... Uh, a number of Instructive, topics. kind yeah, of practical. practical. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and I felt good about that, but I also wanted to achieve a, a, a different uh, level of reading, uh, writing, sorry, and... Um, it occurred to me that I ought to write about my childhood, that there were things there worth exploring. And I thought there were three themes that I would look at. And one was, I was born here in Ontario, but I'm the child of Dutch immigrants. I'm the oldest. I was the first. So my parents always spoke Dutch at home. Dutch okay. was my first language. I didn't learn English until I started playing out on the street at the age of four. My parents gave me a name they couldn't pronounce because the TH... They don't have that sound in Dutch, oh, and so wow. I couldn't. I couldn't even pronounce it uh, in kindergarten. The t teacher taught me how to say my own name. She stuck her finger right in my mouth, wow. and uh, um, so I grew up thinking I'm not Canadian. I'm Dutch, and then right. you know, later I go to Holland and I realize, well, I'm not Dutch, 
So what am I? And, you know, we call this the third culture kid. Okay, so yes. missionary kids have this a lot or the children of diplomats. So I thought that'd be worth exploring. And also I was very pious already as a child. My, my Christian faith was very important to me. I had mystical f- experiences. I mm-hmm. thought that would be worth exploring. Yes. And, uh, and then I thought, oh, yes, it would also be worth exploring my father, who was a great, a great mystery in many ways. He was a very smart man, very intelligent. Uh, he didn't have a lot of education, but he started a highly successful business. Mm. He invented a hybrid model of greenhouses. He exported wow. them all, all over the world. Um, he was very well read. Uh, he was always worth debating because he had many mm. insights, usually insights that were different than anybody else's. So wow. he's an incredible man. I loved him a lot. I still love him a lot. He's been gone uh, 33 years this month. Wow. Um, but he had a number of cha- challenges, shall we say. Sure. He, he had a terrible temper. He abused mm-hmm. alcohol. Uh, there were several incidents with alcohol. And um, the first thing I remember about him is he threw a potted plant at my mother in the living room and went through the oh. picture window. I was three or four at the time. Wow. And on, on several occasions, his wrath focused on me. When I was seven, for example, mm. he, he beat me into a blackout. Oh, so boy. I thought, well, I'll, yeah. I'll explore the mystery of my father. And in the writing, um, I wrote about all these things, and all, all three of them play a role in the book. But the more I wrote, the more I realized the main challenge was to explore this mystery of my father, to dig into the mm. mystery of my father. Yes. And um, and what I realized as I was doing the work, and this had never occurred to me before, but I realized my dad had PTSD. He right. he was brought up by a very abusive father. He lived through two wars. Mm-hmm. The last year of the Second World War, he had to hide in an attic from the Nazis, and mm-hmm. um, and then and then he volunteered for a very brutal war in Indonesia, and uh, he had nightmares for the rest of his life as a result of that. And I realized he had uh, PTSD. And the more I studied about trauma and PTSD, it just really added up. It just made sense of sure. that were inexplicable and painful. And then the more I dug into it, I realized, oh, I have PTSD as well. Um, okay. From the fear, from, from his violence, uh, especially the occasions when he beat me. But I was, you know, I was basically always afraid. I mean, I loved him, but I was always afraid. Yeah. And uh, I realized I had PTSD and this was liberating in many respects because it explained so many things in my life. Like, why do Mm. I struggle? I've had struggles with anger. I have struggles with depression. I have Mm -hmm. struggled with nightmares and Mm -hmm. I've struggled with debilitating uh, migraines for a long time. And so the more I wrote about my dad and my relationship with my dad, I realized this was an opportunity to explore myself deeper as well. Right. I did a lot of family systems work in my 30s. I'm 67 now. Mm-hmm. So about half my age ago, um, I did a lot of family systems work, and it was very, very helpful. But what I realized now was there was more work to do. And yes, the layers. Really, yeah. So really, um, in the writing of this book, something in, inside me said, well, Boris, there's more work for you to do. There's more mm-hmm. for you to figure out. And mm-hmm. in some ways, it's quite difficult because I I plummeted into depression while I was writing the book. Yes. And part, part of it was a very important mentor of mine died, who was a, was a, a pastor, a well-known pastor, and he was a great support to me. He's one of the people I dedicate the book to. Uh, he mm-hmm. died, and uh, that kind of also triggered a Like depression. during the writing of the book, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. And, yes. Yeah. So um, now I derailed myself. No, but, that's uh, okay. Yeah. Well, you were, so, I mean, let me interrupt you there for a second. So, yeah. cause I have a couple of things to interject and then you can pick up yeah. the, I mean, I, there's an interesting relationship between labels for things and people's healing process. And yeah. everyone is kind of different how they navigate that for some people. Yeah labels become limiting and for other people, they become liberating. That's right. And so, you know, to finally say, Oh, this makes sense. And I think I I like to push into the language of PTSR 
as opposed to disorder, I want to use recovery because, oh, okay. because I like that language because what it does is it says, these are normal responses in your nervous yes. system to That's very cool. traumatic events and That's you cool. are in recovery from them. That's correct. You're That's disordered correct. maybe in how you feel and things are not as they ought to be. And you're not feeling like yourself and you're experiencing right. these things, yeah. but you're actually, you don't have a disorder. Uh-huh. You have normal responses and you're in recovery. Yeah. And so. Did you invent the term- no, no, I'm sure I didn't. I forget where I heard it, but, but like it just it. feels more um, hopeful. Right. Yeah. And more right. Uh, validating yeah. and less boxing people in right and so maybe i'm splitting hairs but but i i do feel that sometimes people just need to know oh like it makes sense what was going on and that's not an excuse for your father's behavior but it's uh, there's an empathy that builds to say right um you know i think it's dr chatterjee who has the podcast um live better no feel better, live more is his, he's a great, he's a UK physician. But I remember him saying that he adopted this, like understanding that if I was in those circumstances, I would probably be behaving the same way. Like everyone is trying to do the best they could. And so we build that empathy without diminishing the pain. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's this piece of like, well, yes, like people do the things they do for reasons that come from, who they are and what they've suffered and their, you know, heritage, background, lived experience, all of that. So it it sounds to me like the writing of the book was part of your own personal recovery, you know, that, that yes, it was going to go out into the world. These were some things that would be interesting to explore, but in the writing, you were doing your own healing. Right. 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 So yeah, I really, I really like your approach and I, so I would say two things. One is, so first of all, the understanding that trauma does help us have empathy for other people. So it helped me have mm-hmm. empathy for my dad. But as a pastor, too, it's been really helpful because yes. I just, I've been a pastor for 40 years now. And, um, you know, sometimes you deal with people that seem to have intractable issues. And, um, and sometimes I think, oh, why are they? Why yes. are they making a mistake again that they've made so often? And, or it feels so know, personal how they're behaving or so, things like that, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I could give you all kinds of examples. So, yeah, so could I. But, behavior, yeah, yeah you could probably you would have more than me. But, uh, um, you know, or behavior that's outrageous or whatever. But as a pastor, you know, I have to be empathetic. And um, this actually helps me to be more empathetic, helps me to be yeah. a more patient helps me to be more forgiving, so, for example, of my father. Yes. So, yes. So that's the one, the one side I would emphasize. But I would also say, and I think you were alluding to this as well, it's been really helpful for me to see myself in that light. So, mm. you know, um, there are things that I've struggled with that I've really been ashamed about. Uh, why yes. am I still struggling with this after decades? Yes. And now it makes more sense. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and the irony, and you know this, as a therapist, the irony is once you can name things and identify things uh, and face into them, they don't have the same power over you. So yes, the name it to tame it, which is the okay. cliche phrase, but but it is yeah. we need language to make sense of our experiences to start to move them from that intolerable place right. that they exist to right. a tolerable place. It's always part of our story, but the the frazzled nature of it before we can name it and place it and process right. it yeah. is bristling against us all the time. And right. once we have some language to say, Oh, this is, this is what happened to me there. This is why I understand it right. to have happened. This is where I want to go with it. There's an empowerment that happens. Um, and it's not a, like a toxic positivity reframe by any stretch. Oh. It's an authentic, like, we're just going to say the thing that was here. And that's our starting point. I often think about that even with confession, like you would know more about this, but just that, that like, let's just say what it is. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then we have a place to start our healing. Right. So the healing, the healing will be lifelong. I know that. Um, I know that there are challenges that I face probably every day as a result, Sure. but uh, certainly every week. (laughs) 
Yes. Um, yeah. But, but there are things also that have really shifted and changed mm-hmm. that I've noticed that. And so for one, I'm not having the nightmares I used to have. So that, oh, that's wonderful. very powerful. Yes. And, uh, and the other one, um, even more dramatically, is I had debilitating migraines for decades to the mm-hmm. point where I would go to the emergency room. At one point, I went to the emergency room three times within two weeks because I had what I call suicide zone uh, migraines. Yeah. The pain was so you fierce. You want to escape. Yeah. And so long. Yes. And I don't know when I last took really strong drugs to prevent migraines or to manage the pain. It's been, it's been well over a year for sure. Wow. Uh, and this has to do with, you know, if you read the stuff about trauma, as I understand, and again, you know more than I, but. Um, mm. uh, what, Sounds what like you've done a deep dive here, Arthur. You probably do know quite a bit, but yeah. Well, um, what, you know, one of the things that the um, authorities are telling me is that uh, unresolved trauma is not something you just solve by talking it out or thinking mm-hmm. it through. And it will often lodge somewhere in your body. That's right. And um, uh, I'm not a person who was brought up to pay much attention to my body or actually mm-hmm. my feelings either. Yes. So, um, so I, th- I think the physical healing that I've ex- experienced from them, from no longer having migraines, I think that's connected to the liberation of honestly naming things that have happened in my life yes. and not having to um, store it up. Store it up, store it up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly. I can resonate so deeply with what you're saying. I think as a person, I have more difficulty connecting with my feelings and listening to my body. Like I just live in my head and, you know, and so there's this healing when we start to integrate those, what I would call intelligence centers where, you know, we're getting information about how we're doing through our heart and feelings, through our bodies and intuitions and physiological sensations through our gut, all of that stuff and how we're thinking and rationally processing. We're not independently in these centers, but we often need to raise up the other centers to get the balance and healing we need because we can't always fix a cognitive uh, problem by just continuing to run the same track of cognition. We might have to go in another way. You know, um, so yeah, there's so much to that. That's so interesting. Were you expecting to have that result, like that healing in your body? Like, is that something you were hoping was coming from that? Or was that sort of a byproduct that you're like, wow, there, the body did keep the score and now it's loosened its grip on me. I, it was not anything I had thought about or considered or anticipated or hoped for. Migraines were just something that I coped with. You just thought this this is it. This is how it is. And yeah. Yeah. Cause I tell you, I've been to neurologists. I've been to doctors. I've had MRIs. I've, you know, I've been put, put on, I was, I was, um, there were a few months I couldn't work a number of years ago. Um, wow. you know, so it was pretty intense. So yeah. I just thought, man, just manage. That's what, that's how I talked about it. Managing, learning yes. how to manage it, being aware of triggers and trying to modify the impact. Mm-hmm. Of the migraine. So it's a completely mm-hmm. unexpected gift for me. Well, it's so interesting. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. Uh, well, we were talking about um, living in our heads and not honoring our, or not being aware of our feelings. Yes. What I've learned again uh, through my studies is that that makes sense from my childhood because as a helpless child with your parents, um, as a helpless child, with I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um, as a as a child, you're helpless, and um, you know, in my case, and this is often the case, you have to make a choice between attachment and authenticity. So, mm-hmm. you, you you for your own safety and protection, you choose to be attached to your parents. You cling to your parents, which makes total sense. Sure. Um, and then, in my case, being attached to my parents meant kind of denying the feelings that I had about the hurt or the violation or the abuse or whatever. And so from a very early, early age, a survival response for me was not to take my feelings seriously, which eventually became 
not even to know what my feelings were. I remember the early days, you know, the first times I went to a therapist 40, 40 years ago or so. Yeah. And the therapist would say to me, well, what are you feeling? And I'm like, I don't know. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't yeah. Know what I'm feeling. And okay, well, where are you feeling in your body? And I'm like, I don't know, in my body? I don't, I don't even know what that means. So, yes. so um, that's where Gabor Mate has been very helpful to me. I don't know if you um, yes. like his work, but, but he's hugely influential on me. And um, mm. it's not that attachment is unimportant, because clearly attachment is important. Sure. At some, at some point, you have to make a choice between attachment and authenticity. Yes. And, uh, and you, make, you make a certain choice when you're a child, and it's mm. a reasonable choice for a child. It's a survival right. It that's helped why. you get move forward in the context you found yourself. Yes. That's why the PTS, PTSR framing is really, really helpful because uh, I think that's part of what relieved me of the shame of thinking about these things. As, as I studied this stuff, I thought, oh, it makes total sense yes. that I have these struggles. It makes total sense. And, you know, I'm not going to blame a seven-year-old seven um, for how he dealt with being beat into a, a blackout. Yes. That seven year old was doing was very vulnerable and was doing the best he can. That's right. Anyway, I, I yeah, don't it's our, no, this is so good. Yeah. It's, it's our survival instinct. And so there's this sense in which sometimes we 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 have all the shame about it and then we sort of heap our on ourselves shame about right. well we should have known better as a seven year old right. or something. It's like, well what right. what on earth are we talking about? Like there's this compassion to say yeah, there's a there's a survival instinct that kicks in that says I have to cope and I have to navigate yeah. these circumstances the best I can to keep putting my foot in front of the other foot and keep moving yeah. through. And so it's like thank you mm-hmm. to these compartmentalizing, these yeah. dism- dismissing, repressing, whatever, because they are literally helping us cope and carry forward to yeah. navigate really difficult circumstances. But there does come a point, as you're saying, where that's not serving us anymore. Exactly. We're no longer children in those unsafe environments. And so now we have to say, do I need to shed this? Thank you to this mechanism that's active in me for keeping me alive through that time, for helping me to continue. And I understand it, but also I don't want to move forward in that ongoing fear with repressing my feelings that's not serving me in my healing journey right yeah. so um so for example I, i've mentioned this a couple times i've struggled a number of times with my in my life with depression and burnout mm-hmm. and as a pastor um it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to be depressed and do your work mm-hmm. it's also not appropriate to get up on the pulpit and say you know i'm feeling really depressed these days yeah. um and so that set up a real conflict within within me and a shame. There was a shame about being depressed. Sure. And then, of course, as you know, again, that irony of being able to understand why I was depressed helps free me from those kind of constraints. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting. Mm-hmm. Somebody was talking to me this week about uh, my book, the one we're talking about today, Shattered. Mm-hmm. So somebody at this new church that I'm serving and, uh, this person said, I'm really amazed that as a pastor, you're so vulnerable. You're, you're, you're speaking honestly mm, about the things that yes. you struggle with. And for her, it was quite liberating that I, that I was able mm. to do that. I think it's really, I, I think it's a really courageous thing to actually say, I'm going to go there, right? Uh-huh. Like even in what you said, in what you thought you were going to explore and then what, where that, the act of saying, I'm going to step out this way, it, then it started to direct you. It's like, oh, this is where the work is. And then, oh, it's going to m- require of me to yeah. do this deep work in order to keep actually putting these words on a page to serve others, right? I can't I can't get to the next thing without doing this thing in the midst of it. And not, like you sort of don't have a choice. It, I don't want to compare this in a weird way, but I'll often say to people, you know, uh, your your close relationships, for example, will make you do your work, yes. right? If you're married, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to navigate that relationship well without having some times where you're like, I have to look at myself here. 
Yeah. Right. And not everybody does. And they continue right. in unhappy and dysfunctional relationships all the time. But between your your partner in life and your kids, there's a, a mirror that's going to come up to you that says, if you want to navigate this, you're going to have to learn some new tools. You're going right. to have to have some hard conversations. You're going to have to have some humility. And, you know, mm-hmm. and those are hard things for people to do. And so that vulnerability, if people even have a taste of that in their lives, to have someone say, I'm going to do that. And not only am I going to do that, I'm going to put it on pages for yes. you to see. Right. 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 And so it's like, that's next level vulnerability. Yeah. And yes. yet it invites others. Right. So a couple things to say about that. One is um, I, I, I listen to a lot of interviews of authors and writers. I find that fascinating. Yes. And same. Yeah. So often authors will say, this is not what I intended to write, like, right. you know, or, 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 or novelists will say, um, you know, this character, I don't know where this character came from and this yeah. character is not working according to what I planned. And I it had author, its own trajectory. Yeah. Yes. I heard another author recently was asked in, by the interviewer, well, why did you choose this topic for your book? And the writer said, well, actually you don't understand writing. Um, it's not right. that we the topics, the topics choose us. Yes. And that was my experience with this, that, you know, I had this kind of, I thought, oh, you know, cute, quaint childhood, I'm going to write about that. But there was something within my system that said, there is something you need to work on. This is the thing. And there was mm-hmm. a kind of convergence. I, I actually did a Master of Fine Arts in writing um, during oh. this process. I wanted to learn how to write better. And, you know, there was this death, the death of this important mentor that I mentioned. Yes. Uh, uh, one of my children got married. You know, there's just all kinds of stuff going on. Lots and of feelings in all those things. Exactly. Uh, and, yes. Um, they all came together to make a perfect storm to tell me this is the time to do the work. And mm-hmm. I was a little shocked because I, I thought I had done the work I needed to do. Mm-hmm. Who knows what other kind of work I have to do down the road. Um, and then what I, what I would also say is that <clears throat> I'm getting very mixed responses from extended family about this book. Mm. Nobody says these things didn't happen. Everybody agrees on the basic facts. Right. Uh, but they say, well, why would you write about this? Why would you right. write it? And and their mm-hmm. kind of rule is you don't talk about unpleasant things, let alone yes. write about them. And, um, yeah. and they say, well, why would you write about these things? And I'm sort of like, well, well I'm a writer. <laughs> and a writer's right. And uh, yeah. well, why, w- why would you publish this? That's the next question. Right. And I, I'm putting that out. There's there's two reasons why I publish it, really. And one is it's a ministry. It's putting it out there. It's yes. giving permission for people to explore. I have somebody coming to see me today who read the book and wanted to talk about the book because of the implications for his own life and upbringing. He's a few years older than I am. He, he's in his 70s. Yeah. And, um, and I've had this a lot, that people want to have a meal or coffee or, and they want to talk. So it's a ministry. It's a ministry. And the other well, thing you become is, a safe person for their secrets, yeah, right. for their things that are the unpleasant things not to be able to talk right. about. Yeah. Right. So it's a freeing up for other people. And the other thing is, the other is, um, I had to do a book, I had to do a book event near where I used to live. And some of my relatives objected and said, we really wish you wouldn't do that book event. And um, I thought about that a lot. Mm-hmm. And I thought about the tension between attachment and authenticity. Mm-hmm. Gabor mm-hmm. Mate says, if you have to choose, but you know, as an adult, if you get into a dilemma where you're choosing between a, a, authenticity and attachment, you choose authenticity. Yes. Authenticity might make you feel some sense of guilt, um, mm-hmm. but attachment will make you feel uh, or yeah, if you if you if you if you go for attachment, it will it will make you feel resentful. Yes. And so I decided to go through with the book event. Yes. And the book event was like two miles from where my father beat me into a blackout. And wow. then I still think about you know it still bothers me, uh, sure. not the same way as in the past, but um, you know I have to yeah. discipline myself when I think about it. And uh, mm. anyway, when I was doing that book event, I realized you know what, little Arthur was beaten into a blackout two miles from here. Mm-hmm. I'm speaking on his behalf. Yes. I'm speaking up for him. Yes. And, and one and of the for, things about, 
other little Arthurs out there. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. One of the most harmful things about traumatic experience mm-hmm. is not even necessarily the violence or the horror of the event. It's the fact that nobody else acknowledges it or spoke up for you or yeah. stood up. There were a number of adults around when my father beat me into a blackout. And yes. they did not pull my father off until I was blacked out. And then I woke up a few hours later and nobody ever spoke to me about this event. Um, that's, that's classic. And that's, that's right. Way that's of, sadly so many people's experience. All yeah, these bystanders around, right. no, right. not advocating, not stepping in and saying this is not okay. Right. Yeah. So I'm, we need I'm, voices that are saying this is not okay. Right. So I was speaking on his behalf. I was speaking mm-hmm. on his behalf and I was speaking to him mm-hmm. within, as well. within you. Yes. So the big, the big project I'm working on right now, I mean, you didn't ask this, but it's relevant. No, let's let's I'm, go there. I'm, uh, I'm doing a trauma informed exploration of the Good Samaritan story. There's a oh, lot of fascinating. Interest, there's a lot of interest these days in trauma informed theology and trauma informed sure. reading scripture. Yes. And um, the Greek word from which we get trauma means wound. Yes. And that particular word appears only once in the New Testament, and it's in the Good Samaritan. It's the mm-hmm. wounds of the victim. So that's sort of intriguing. And you can see what I was saying right in that story where this man was beaten and then he was passed by on the other side yeah. by the priest and the Levite. That's yeah. classic kind of setting yeah. for Tom. And then the Samaritan intervene, intervened and took his wounds seriously and addressed them. And one could reasonably hope that as a result, that victim will not have PTSD. Right. So I'm doing kind of this imaginative exploration. Sure. Yeah. Trauma informed perspective. Right. Because what because what happens in the system is what completes the loop. Right. So you often we get these open moments of trauma, and um, you know what allows us to heal and close the loop of that trauma in a yeah. way that doesn't become you know perpetually. Uh, you know, animating our behaviors right. moving forward. Right. And right. so there's, there's this hopefulness, like, uh, you know, I experienced some childhood trauma as well. And um, one of the things that my parents did that I, I'm very thankful they did was they put me in therapy right away. Okay. And so at nine years old, wow. I was having conversations that were healing that didn't yeah. allow me to carry stories exactly. from a nine-year-old you know, uh, nine, 10, um, through till my adulthood. And then realize those stories aren't correct. I don't have to have shame about this. I, you know, and I'm not saying that that was easy. I mean, that was a hard thing to think of, you know, for a, a child to have to navigate, but the truth is they're navigating it anyway. Yes. And so in, in a therapeutic setting, they can have conversations that are hopeful, that are healing, that are, allowing them to process in ways. And that's not to say, again, it's a lifelong journey. There are layers that unfold. And, at, but I, you know, that early intervention of the, that Samaritan, so to speak, therapist in my life who came alongside yeah. at the point of injury, yes, as close to it as it could, and then had some conversations that allowed me to, to heal, I think, faster and not have those hidden, buried injuries in my body. Now, again, it's not perfect. There are still examples of ripple effects of that, but I do see people who didn't have that in my practice when they were little and I see the difference. Yeah. 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 So it's no coincidence, Sarah, I think that um, you and I are both in helping professions. That's right. Something that we learned through those experiences. Yeah. Um, The wounded healer kind of perspective. Henry Henry Nowen. Yes. A few years ago, um, I had a really bad weekend connected to all this stuff. And at the last minute, I wasn't able to fulfill my Sunday duties. I just needed a few days off. And another yeah. priest got in for me. And he didn't, he, he, he's a friend of mine, but he didn't know, he didn't really know anything about my situation. And so yeah. later I thanked him for stepping in for me. And he said, 
Oh yeah. He said, yeah, I was glad to do that. He said, were you ill? And I said, well, I'm, I'm struggling with some trauma stuff. I have PTSD. And he said, Oh, Arthur, I had no idea. And, um, and then we talked about it for a while. And I said, emotionally, one, one aspect of trauma is that I actually feel emotional pain pretty much every day, mm -hmm. some level. There's always something there yeah. always, that I have to reckon with. Mm -hmm. And he seemed sort of startled and he pondered that a little bit. And he said, Arthur, I don't want to, I don't know, I don't want to minimize your pain in any way. But I think that that's part of reason, the reason why you're such a good pastor. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think we're close to the wounds, right? Yeah. Our wounds, right? We are wounded healers. And we're, I know Yalom talks about in, um, yeah. uh, you know, we're fellow sojourners, right? We're, yeah. we are not, I think there's a lot when you come into therapy. I know for me and for all of the people on my team who I'm mentoring and supervising, there, there's a lot of imposter syndrome that comes in. Like, who am I to yeah. step in and, and right. advise people or to work with, like, I mean, my life's a mess or I have these things or yeah. like, I'm definitely not perfect. And like, I don't know enough, but there's, there's this um, liberation that comes from saying, yeah, we're all living in our stories in the places we are. And there's, there's some prudence for sure. Like certain, certain staff members here aren't taking on certain cases that would be right. triggering and, and not good for their own well-being yeah. in the delivery of that healing but there is also this we there's this appreciation and we all have our stories that give us a heart for the ways in which we want to invite other people into healing and we're not healed we're not perfected we're not you know it's not done um but we have enough of that hopefulness that it can be different that understanding and compassion that it doesn't have to be this way i remember profoundly doing an exercise like a logotherapy exercise looking at turns um that i was introduced to through actually donald miller back in the day and we the idea was that you mapped out turns in your life um on this sort of chronological scale i don't know if you're familiar with this exercise but essentially I won't get too much into the de details about it, but essentially you're, you're kind of looking at these moments and capturing these moments at a high level, kind of to look down at it as a landscape of like the points in your life where this thing happened and I was not the same after that. It was a turn. I couldn't go back to being the person before. So an easy example of that is my first child. I can't go back to not being a mom. Like, I can't go back to the person I was before that. I am now part of the story is that I'm a mother. Or, you know, when yeah. people lose someone important, you were talking about your mentor. I mean, you that's now an integrated part of your story and your grief. You you can't go back to being the person who hasn't lost that person, right? And there are other moments. Some of them are small and some of them are large. But these are moments that we don't have to uh, take very much time to remember. They're with us and we can see that they have shaped us. And my point with sharing all of this is when I looked at my life and I looked at how these positive and negative turns sort of mapped out, if you will, from a aerial view. The invitation was to look at that with curiosity and say, are there themes? And the theme that was so strong for me is your past does not have to dictate your future. And I had, and so for me coming into therapy, this was kind of coinciding with me feeling I was a teacher before. I think you know that about my story, but untethering from the golden handcuffs of the teaching career to step into something that I felt called to do. And, um, and I remember thinking, like, I believe that hope. Like, I've seen that at play. I'm a, I've seen people who have gone through what I've gone through, living yeah. very different, unhealthy lives, but they don't have to. Right. There's ways for them to find hope, to find healing, to not feel trapped, yes. all of those things. And so it's just these these insights that we get on our own journeys. It's like we want to tell other people where to find the water. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so with those tensions, I love that um bring forward that uh, Mate distinction between, you know, attachment and authenticity. You know, sometimes the word I would use there is incongruence, right? Oh, yeah. That we're yeah. not aligned within ourselves. And we realize that because there's a tension internally when we say yes to something or no to something that's going to create that resentment. It's right. like, no, that that wasn't authentic, that wasn't an authentic yes or no. 
And so, you know, the, the boldness and the courage to say, I know that some of my actions might um, upset people in my extended family. It might cause shame to come forward for them. It might not be the things that they would choose. And I'm not saying that they have to put their stories on, on paper, but I know for me authentically, I need right. to speak up for a seven-year-old Arthur yeah. and for others to feel like they're act- they can be liberated from that shame. Their secrets don't have to stay in the shadows, right? It's we, we bring them to the light and I can, I've done enough of my own work that this is hard for me. I'm not, it's, I don't think it's ever easy to talk about our own stories. I think we, um, we heal every time we tell them, you know, yeah. but I do also think that um, you get to a certain point where you say, I don't want that other person sitting in that audience at the book event who has a story like this to feel like their story can't be told that they don't have hope that they have to sit in these shadows and that's it. And that this, they have to um, just keep coping um, and they can't, you know, they can't have opportunities. Everyone can decide where they want to go with that invitation, but we want to invite people to the possibility of doing that deep work and, and, share our stories as a, as a testimony that it can, that things can change, that you can have, you can get rid of those nightmares. You can get rid of those migraines. I mean, that's, I'm not saying that's an A plus B equals C necessarily for everyone, but you know, we've seen it, we've lived it. We are evangelicals, if you will, (laughs) for the process. (laughs) Um, Okay. This has been, this is so great. I mean, I'm sure we could talk as we did on the doc for much longer, but I know we have to think about bringing this to a close. And so first, let me just say, um, could you just provide a couple of words to people? I know we've kind of talked about this, but maybe just some words to people who, um, you know, was wounded by someone who was meant to protect them and someone for whom, you know, this story might be both very difficult for them to read because of the things it might bring up for them. And and I want to encourage people to be aware of that within themselves if they're engaging with trauma stories and you have your own trauma story. You know, there's an important um, self-awareness that you need to know when to back off and to be careful with yourself and gentle with yourself, um, just as you, I'm sure, did in the writing process. Um, but what would you want to say to that person who says, you know, I have my own story like that. Um, you know, what, where do I go from here? How could I start that healing process? So I guess I would say uh, several things, but I think the, I think the main thing would be, Find some place or someone who is safe to talk about these things. Yeah. Process them. And I would say that it sometimes it can feel daunting to face into this stuff. Yes. So hard. Uh, it looks so burdensome. But the freedom that comes on the other side yeah. makes the journey worthwhile. That, that, that's what I believe. I say it's a good kind of hard. Yeah. 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 Um, we haven't really talked theologically uh, today, and I don't know how much theology you do on your. On your <laughs> we podcast. do a little bit. We dabble here and there. We have a mixed audience, <laughs> but yeah. But you know, I, I do really honestly believe um, what I was taught by another of my mentors, Henry Nowen, who's a pretty well known uh, yeah writer. He told me once when I went and saw him, I was supposedly doing just an uh, an interview for a a magazine. Um, he, he quickly perceived something was going on in my life and made me stay the whole day. I was only supposed to be there for an hour in the morning, stayed the whole day. Wow. Amazing that you got to meet him. Wow. Yeah, it was wonderful. And I have a chapter about him in the book shattered because Mm -hmm. there was a later incident with him when I was writing my book and I reflected back on it. I could see in that incident how God was unwinding a number of traumatic things that happened to me in very dramatic ways. Wow. Actually responded, echoed in an opposite way, terrible things that ha- happened to me. Um, and he became a, an amazing father figure for me. Yes, uh, for so many, really. Yeah, 
And, and, you know, he spoke with a Dutch accent like my own dad did. So that was, that was right. interesting. Wow. Uh, but he said, Arthur, what you have to trust is that God is the one who loves you deeply. Mm. And you have to keep trusting, keep trusting, keep trusting. Mm. And that's really been um, a focus for my own spirituality mm. to keep coming back to. But it's also become central to my ministry as a pastor to sure. keep exposing people to God's deep, love deep for them. abiding, unconditional grace mm. filled love. Keep trusting, keep trusting, keep yeah. trusting. The, the, is it Brendan Manning who says the furious longing of God? Mm. The furious it, longing of God, which yeah. is to love us, <laughs> that is good. you know, and to understand. And, you know, we hear those words. I know now and writes about your belovedness, right? And we hear those words and we think, I don't know fully what that means, but just to say it's, I, I, I'm catching a glimpse and I'm leaning in yeah. to more of that belovedness That's and exactly. it's profound. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Know that you're beloved and, mm -hmm. and find people who can help you in the healing process. That's yeah. so great. And of course, that's exactly what we're here for <laughs> at Covey Wellness Center. That's why we exist to say to people, this is a, this is a safe place for you to step into that work and we're going to walk with you. Yeah. Um, and we love you and that's why we're here. And so, um, if people are struggling after this conversation, um, and, and do want to reach out and get support by all means, you know, coveywellnesscenter.com, fill out mm -hmm. the contact us form and, and reach out. We want people to know that we're here for them. Mm -hmm. So on a maybe slightly lighter note, depending on how you answer this, yeah. um, we are asking everybody in this series because we know that writers are readers, these two things. I have yet to meet a writer who's not a reader and I probably wouldn't want to read them if they weren't <laughs> speaking of good writing. That's a whole other conversation we could get into. Um, but we're asking people what's in your bedside book stack. So those of us who know what this looks like is there's a stack beside our bed that yeah. we're reading of books that are, you know, sort of in the queue. And so I'm curious what's inspiring you right now. What What's filling your soul and in your bedside book stack? Well, I love good writing. I love great writing. And there's yes. an author in Nashville that I like quite a bit. Her name is Margaret Renkel, R-E-N-K-L. Mm. And mm -hmm. she writes wonderfully about nature um, and about her faith. She's a Roman Catholic. Wow. And she intermingles it with kind of political commentary and uh, commentary wow. about environmental crises. She's like somebody. an Annie Dillard type? Yeah, she's Annie Dillard. Um, I like Annie Dillard, but Annie Dillard can get kind of, her writing can get kind of wild, wild, wild and weird sometimes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I yeah. don't know how much you've read of her. Um, yeah. uh, Margaret Rankle's a little more down down to earth, but I, I just think she's a mm. wonderful, wonderful writer. Oh, well, I, I do not know her, and I already okay. know I'm going to love that. Yeah, she sure. For a while, she wrote um, columns for the New York Times. She still writes for them. Sometimes there was an article in the New York Times just recently by her, a column mm -hmm. um, talking about how allergies actually are getting worse. Um, mm -hmm. They're getting more prolonged, and uh, yeah. partly this is connected to climate change. So she's a, a person of, of great value. Another writer I like is um, some somebody called Rick Bass. He's an essayist. Essayist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Montana. He's not a person of faith, but he writes beautiful, beautiful med meditations on ecology. So those be two that. Wow, so mind. fascinating! Yeah. Bring us full circle back to our our first meeting on the on the river that we want yeah, to return to. Yeah, that's so that's so wonderful. Well, we will um, link to all of those resources um, in the show notes, and for people who want to reach out um, to you, Arthur, and know what you're working on and where your events might be or what your right. ministry is, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? you know, the best way is um, to check out my website. It's arthurboers.com and uh, Boers is B-O-E-R-S. Right. Uh, you, you can look up my book, Shattered. A son picks up the pieces of his father's rage. On the website, you can also see other books that I've written. And um, there's email information there. So people can 
reach out directly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Um, And so again, for those of you driving or listening while you're doing something and not jotting that down, we'll make sure all those are in the show notes so you can reference them later. And um, Sarah Piercy, one of the other Sarahs that works here at the center with us does a beautiful job of um, coordinating and uh, orchestrating the podcast and keeping those notes for our listeners. So shout out to Sarah for that. Well, Well, Arthur, I really appreciate you too. All of Thank the time you. that you have given to this and to sh- and I I commend you for your courage in in going there and in writing the story and in holding on to that authenticity. And so I just um I just think it's so important, you know, for for us first and for the others that we serve. And so um I look forward to our next conversation yeah. <laughs> and uh, our next uh, project together. Perfect. I look for you on the river. What's that? Look for me on the river. Yes. Oh, yes. Look for my, me on the river. <laughs> all my um, my place there, I call it Glad River. And yes. uh, that's after, there's two allusions there. One of my favorite novels is a novel called Glad River. Mm-hmm. And that's referring to a verse in Psalm 46. There is a yes. river whose streams make glad the city of God. Yes. You know, when... Uh, when our friend's house was being built there, the one where you stay occasionally for retreats. Yeah. They, very early, they had a sign up that said River Retreat. I think that's what it says, River Retreat. That's right. Yeah. And I thought, I wonder, what, is that going to be a retreat center or a lodging? Just for or me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was really intrigued by it. And I gave uh, it that name. Did you? I did. Nice. Yeah. Nice. We, good to know. There's a really neat story as well that I'll tell you more about. But we were there the day we were trudging through the snow towards yeah. the property the day yeah. that that our friends got word that they had got the property and that this dream was coming to fruition. Yeah. And we talked about it and I said, you got to call it the river retreat. And so, yeah, yeah, for I sure. Really- I immediately started fantasizing about I'm getting in my boat, paddling down the river to visit the river retreat. Well, well, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? I would love to have Covey Wellness Retreat Center sometime down the road, down the river. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, it would be. We'll see what God is doing in the coming years. But uh, yeah. but yeah, thank yeah. you so much again for this conversation. It's been so rich and encouraging to my heart as well. And I just... I hope others will find the book helpful and resources helpful on their own healing journeys. And you take care until we meet again. All right. Thanks. Blessings to you, Sarah. Thank you for your good work. You're welcome.